Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Harris Geospatial on one of the many webinar series that we've been doing, um, as everyone, of course, has not been able to go into their office. Um, so if you were able to join us last week, we had, well, two weeks ago previously, we had an awesome webinar on Envy uh, IDL, using IDL and combining that with Python. And this, this webinar, we're going to look at extending Envy and future-proofing your code with, with Envy tasks. I know there are a lot of um, you that may be dialing in who are used to our old Envy do-its. Um, those are still around, but as we move to the new Envy and things like our, our modeler and our, our geospatial services framework, we wanted to minimize the cost of entry into enterprise and cloud by not having you have to write code over again. So we've done that by doing something we call TAS, which Mr. Greg Terry, who will be your main presenter today, uh, will go over. Um, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, there will be uh, slides, uh, data, or sample snippets of code available for you after uh, this webinar ends. You will get a separate link letting you know that that is available for you to download and go back. Um, having said that, all of the previous webinars as well are available for you to go back and watch. And also those that had data um, that was used during the presentations are available as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question dashboard and uh, either we will answer it immediately just to you or we will announce it for the entire group. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Terry. Well, thanks, James. Appreciate it very much. Welcome again for everyone that's joined us previously. And if this is your first one, uh, you know, I'm glad you can join us. Um, like I said, James uh, mentioned this seminar is going to be about, you know, how to talk about our envy tasks uh, and, you know, how they can be used and how you can create them and, and uh, utilize them in multiple ways. So, um, uh, a little bit about myself. I, I was a uh, customer uh, long before I've been working for uh, Harris Geospatial Solutions for 15 years. I was a customer before that uh, using IDL, and I use every version of Envy since it was created. That dates me a little bit, but that's how it goes. So, um, so I basically have seen Envy grow up. Um, so, what we're going to do today? We're going to talk a little bit about. Um, you know, no view. We'll talk about what MV and IDL tasks are. So yes, there are IDL tasks too. Although most of the presentation will be focused on MV tasks, but there's IDL tasks and an example for that. We'll talk about some of the key components, how to run them. We even have an example about how to convert existing routines to a task, and that's really gonna. And we're really gonna use an example from our MV Classic API, uh, how to how to bring those over into this framework, and we'll have some examples. Uh, for you to try as well and to review on your own afterwards. Uh, so this, if you've attended previous seminars, except for the last one, uh, they focused on the user interface and how to run Envy, et cetera. And, uh, today is more about the extensibility. Uh, Envy tasks help our users um, uh, create custom, custom tools, custom processing uh, capabilities that don't come with this desktop application that we provide, and that's by design. So our API allows our users to have all the flexibility they need. It also allows us to take those tasks and integrate them with other tools like RGIS and some of the enterprise capabilities that we'll, we'll mention today. We're not gonna focus on those today, but um, uh, we've talked about them multiple times already in the previous uh, seminars. So today, um, you know, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna overview the MV and IDL tasks. We have some hands-on examples. You'll see some code, so um, and we'll we'll work with the code too, and we'll run them. You'll see some demonstrations. I have provided a um, uh, a document on uh, a web-based uh, document here. Uh, this one right here that uh, is in your uh, 
your package that we deliver. So it, this is a very comprehensive, a pretty well detailed description uh, or, or, or tutorial of how to use tasks and all all the um, uh, some of the key items associated. I'm not going to walk through this directly, but you'll if you you can go back and review this yourselves, and uh, you'll see where I I pulled information from this as well as other places. So this is this will be included along with some the sample data and all the code that you're going to see later on. Okay. Uh, so as James mentioned, uh, this this seminar is being recorded. Uh, we're going to be using Windows 10 today, uh, but tasks work whether you're on Windows, uh, Linux, or, or Mac. They all work the same way. Uh, so, and the intended audience for this seminar is really those who've done scripting and programming uh, in IDL and MV, um, and those who've also developed custom MV applications in uh, various various ways in the past. All right, so requirements for this seminar are very simple. And be an IDL. So hopefully, you have, as part of the seminar, you've already gotten a copy of this. If you haven't yet, uh, this is what we're going to be using uh, for today. All right. So where, where, before we talk about what a task is, let's talk a little bit about where they, where do we use these? Well, first, at the desktop level, they're part of, they, they can be added and enabled as part of user applications. That includes IDL. And as well as Envy, and Envy is a is a just a huge IDL application. So, uh, and it's a standard way of getting of uh, enabling these these uh, processing tools uh, and functions uh, as part of your application. We'll talk about that. It allows you to support batch processing from the command line, also from the modeler, as you can see over there in the picture on the right. It allows us to integrate with other desktop tools like ArcMap, ArcGIS Pro. So once you bring them into their environments, then they can be used as part of ArcGIS Model Builder. So you can build sophisticated workflows that way. Uh, you can also enable these as, uh, to be run uh, via an MV extension. You'll see that later. And I already mentioned a modeler. Now, so that's at the desktop. But as James mentioned earlier, you know, we our, our users and our customers are, are more and more wanting to deploy things to the cloud and in an enterprise. So the MV task system allows us to do that in a consistent way. Um, and so now allows us to work with our geospatial services framework or GSF and provide access to those tasks through RESTful services. So standard ways of calling these that everyone else uses for their things. So you can also integrate because of that, then you can integrate these things in a web clients like you see on the bottom right, bottom left. Uh, and it, and also in those environments, cobble via command line and interfacing with other languages at the operating system level, Python for sh uh, as well as uh, as well. So there's a lot of flexibility and um, uh, how these can be used. All right, so so what are these MV and IDL tasks? Well, they're um, they're object they're object-oriented API to basically encapsulate our encapsulate MB and IDL procedures. So it's just a standard way to a consistent way to do these things. We can consume they can be used by MB IDL and or GSF or other things as well. The key thing, and James mentioned that at the beginning, you write these tasks once once, and if you follow the the methodology that we outline in the API descriptions and examples. You can use these in multiple ways: the desktop, that's cloud, uh, through web clients, the command line, and you only have to write it once. And you can, you know, so this is the value. This helps you uh, uh, save on uh, reinvesting, having to write something else to work in the cloud. No, it's just you write it once, put it in a certain directory, and our, our tools can find them, and you can make and take advantage of them. So that's that's really one of the big key selling points here. Um, and I know there's a lot of text here. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, but um, so there's uh, for us, for the users, and also for us developers, you know, there's a single entry point for for tasks to, to to access these. So for, for IDL, there's this IDL task function. You'll see these later, MV task function. Uh, these uh, these things also allow us to store the input and output parameters so that, that we can access access them access them. Sorry, through the API, uh, we can discover what tasks are available. 
do this ideal query task catalog task sorry this task names method uh, for envy as well it gives a list of all the tasks that are available and not just the ones that we provide with the product but also your custom tasks that you've developed and and, and deployed in the in a place where envy and ideal can discover them so um and the cool thing is when you uh set all the parameters and right during execution, when it, you enter the command to execute those, the, the task system validates whether you've supplied all the required inputs and outputs for the for that particular task. So for us, for us developers, um, it allows us a, um, a way to wrap existing libraries of, of functions or routines. Um, and that's important because if you've been around like as long as I have, and some of you that I've worked with who've developed all kinds of functions and algorithms and routines uh, in, in Envy and also in Classic, this allows us to, to uh, enable them, those tools in this system as well, therefore expanding our, your, uh, uh, in increasing and leveraging your, your investments in those tools that you've done already. Um, and then, the other thing I'll point out, you know, these tasks can be executed from other programming languages. If you were on the last last class, we talked about uh, we we saw how Python can be used to call these tasks, um, and then when you integrate these things in into uh, ArcGIS, well, Python is its programming and scripting language, so you're accessing them behind the scenes. But you can also call these at the command line through DOS or Linux, uh, batch scripts, and et cetera. So there's standard ways of doing these. There is um, uh, one of the cool things that we've developed with this, and you'll see some examples of this later, is this the ability to, ger to generate dynamic widget, dynamically create widget programs is really what I want to say. And what that means is, you know, if you've ever developed a, a, a processing tool and you want to build a widget to prompt the user for the parameters, this task system builds that for you automatically. You don't have to write, generally you don't have to write any widget code. You'll see how simple this is and how this works shortly. But it's pretty powerful there as well. Um, in Envy today, as of 5.5.3, there's 200, over 230-something 230 Envy tasks. Already you'll, uh, we'll, you'll see some of these. There's also, we only have three IDL tasks. Uh, but because of the API, we can create unlimited numbers of tasks. So we're not limited by that any by any stretch of imagination. So here's kind of a pictorial, of uh, Lisa Emmy's list of tasks here. Um, if you go to, let me switch over to my browser here. So in our help, you get to see a, the whole full list of them. And what's cool, you can come over here and, um, let's see, which one do I want? Yeah, you can pick any one. Uh, you know, the help's pretty nice. It tells you all the parameters and the methods that you can set. It also gives you um, example code of how to call them, how to set them out. So you can copy and paste this in your routine and use these. Uh, we'll show you how to build these things in, in a little while. Um, so if you want to find out at, at the API level what the names of all these tasks are, here's the command that you would, you would go about uh, doing those. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of the basic components of these MV and IDL tasks. Uh, so one, it has to be an IDL procedure, uh, not a function. So, <clears throat> so that's a limitation. So and we'll talk about if you have functions, what to do about those. Um, but the parameters, and then also the, the parameters that go with that procedure have to be keywords, not positional parameters. So the top line right here, is, uh, Input underscore raster is set as a keyword, so is output raster URI. That's how you would, uh, it's the, the uh, structure you'd have to create, not the second one where we have these as positional um, parameters. Now, what happens if I have an algorithm that, or a routine that, that has positional parameters? Well, you have two choices. Either you can go make them keywords, or you can create a, a lightweight wrapper around it that's actually then, quote unquote, the task. That then calls your your procedure, and you same thing you would do with a function. So you don't have to necessarily go and modify all your code just to make this work. 
especially it's a fairly extensive tool, you can just go and create a, uh, a very short, small, uh, lightweight tool that just gathers the inputs and then passes that to the function. So you'll see me do that for when we, in our example, where we're going to convert this, enable this uh, classic, uh, MB Classic routine to a task. And so you see how we, we do that. Um, the task system uh, not only uh, requires a, a, a program, a dot pro file, it also needs this def task definition file. So it's in JSON format, and then basically it defines what the name of the task is, um, it's calling routine, and then the parameter names, their data types, whether they're inputs or outputs, whether they're optional or required, any default values, descriptions, or any of that kind of stuff. You'll see what that looks like short in a second. Uh, also, important, and I mentioned this before, when you execute, execute these tasks, it does validation. So with, to make sure that we've passed in all the required parameters. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and that's nice because me as the programmer, if I know that ahead of time, I don't necessarily have to go and be as rigorous as far as checking every single parameter and make sure, hey, did, did you set this? Did you set this? Did you set this? You can just assume that when this routine gets called, it's going to have all the required parameters that it needs. Um, so that's that's very valuable in that. So the other key point in here is that you don't want to have, you can't have, you don't want to develop a task that requires a user to do something during the course of running that task. So um, you don't want to prompt the user for an input file name inside your task. You want to assume that it's passed in. You don't want to prompt the user to select a different color or, or set a value. You All that needs to be set at the parameter level when the when the task is being called. So those are part of your parameters. Uh, if you follow that, then, then it should be great. Um, task can um, also call other tasks internally. You will see that profusely. You don't have to have a task. Generally, we create tasks that do one thing, but that one thing could incorporate uh, calling other tasks that are quote unquote helper ones. And you'll see an example of what I mean shortly. And then as I mentioned, these style templates, and I do want to, I do want to poke this out because this is, this is uh, very valuable for us that, um, that uh, end up building um, interactive and widget programs. So as I mentioned, the task framework allows you to um, automatically uh, create some user interface tools, user, user interface components. And so, and I don't have to write any code. So you can augment that and customize it even further by using these, using these user interface elements. And what's cool, you can select the color table. So the, instead of me having to build a widget for allowing a user to select the color, color table, uh, we already have that there. And uh, by setting this status, by configuring your dot style file for that, now you it will automatically, uh, based on the data type it's associated with, uh, you get access to these widgets, and you don't have to you don't have to create the widget, you don't have to capture the events from the widget. It does all that for you behind the scenes, underneath the hood, and therefore you can create very very effective uh, user interfaces uh, with these things. So you can get coordinate systems, you can prevent uh, you know get points, or you can also um, uh, allow uh, disable like subsetting if you don't want them to do it, just want to select a file. So all, all kinds of powerful. I'll, I'll let you guys look through these uh, at your leisure. But these are very valuable and very powerful um, options to help you build not only just a processing task, but also an interactive uh, capability when you're, especially when you're trying to add this as an extension. Okay. So all right. So that's good with that. Um, all right. So now let's just say, oh, let's talk about where do I put these things so that. Uh, Ideal and Envy can discover this, discover these tasks. So for the dot profile and task files, if if you're working in Ideal only, then they need to be placed on the Ideal path. So you'll see me do this into, you'll see what this, what I, how I do that when I when we run an example for that. But they need to be on the Ideal path so that Ideal can discover them. If you have multiple ones of of them, you can put them all in one local directory if that makes sense and 
provide that path, and then IDL can discover them. Um, for Envy, you have a couple options, a few options. So uh, you can place, there's this custom code directory in your Envy install directory, usually given by this, this, uh, this path if you're on Windows. Um, you can put them there. Uh, and generally, you would put the dot profile in the, or, or what I would recommend, compile and integrate a save file and the task file there and the style file too, for that matter. Um, or you can put these in your your user custom code directory, which is usually this one on Windows. Uh, again, you would put the style, the save, and the task file. You don't want to put the pro and the save file in there. So pick which one. I highly recommend the save file though. I'll tell you why in a second. And then, or you can set this MB custom code environment variable uh, as well. And so again, you can put all your tasks, especially if you're using it, working in, the, in a uh, collaborative environment and you don't want everyone to have their own copy of it. You can put them in a central location. Everybody point to that directory, do this, this environment variable, as long as they can all access it, access it that way, then that works. Um, you want to have this, you, I highly recommend after you've done all your testing and you're happy with your, your code to create a save file. It, uh, it's, uh, it, it'll, um, if you're going to use it in GSF, you definitely have to have the save file, it's, and it also works better if you if you're deploying to ArcGIS, uh, the ArcGIS tool uh, platform that you need to have that save file too. Um, so it's and then folks, if they don't have IDL, they can't use the task uh, if you provide it only the dot profile. So uh, so it's best to, when you're done with it, you're happy with it, create the save file. Okay. We're getting to code. Now we're going to get some code. I promise it's all about code. Um, so here's an example. Uh, just uh, we'll highlight a few things, and we'll, we'll go to the ideal workbench and work with these more directly. So here's here's a procedure. This classify underscore raster procedure. This is my task. This is what I call my task. This is my program that I wrote. That's going to do something. That's going to do some processing. Or whatever it's going to do. And it's going to produce some output, whether it's a raster, or it's a vector, or it's an ROI, whether it's whatever, whatever you need it to be. Whether it's a number, it could be a number. It doesn't have to be a, an image or shapefile or anything like that. Uh, so it, here's, like I said, it has to have keyword parameters. So here, input raster and output raster URI. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, my task can do other process, can do some processing, fancy dancy. I mean, we have this cool. Uh, feature extraction algorithm that I created to find uh, find buildings or find some unique uh, or do some hyperspectral target detections of a new target algorithm. I can do that fancy processing or so I can do that. I can also incorporate other MV tasks to do uh, to help me do my work. So help me with my algorithm. So uh, here I, I, I've called four different MV tasks: one to do isodata classification, to do, and these other three to help smooth it out and create the output. So, um, so you can combine, as I said, you can combine multiple tasks into a single task uh, to do this particular whatever this thing I'm doing. So this is a basic, simple example. Uh, so on the right, <clears throat> here's a a, uh, a a procedure that is used to call this particular task. Task. So, um, and um, to initiate an instance of that task, I use this MV task function. I give it it's the name of the task. Now, note that this. I'll tell you why this doesn't match the name of my uh, task procedure in a second. You'll see why that's named this way. Don't. don't uh, we'll talk about that. And then here's my. Uh, here's the the uh, method I use or the function that I call to bring up the dynamic user interface to allow the user to set the input parameters, input and output parameters. And then and then uh, after I set all those parameters, then I do ex this task.execute. So it's going to actually run that task. And when it's done, I'm going to have access to the output parameter, this output raster. And then I can display, then I go and I can display those results. Okay. Now, so I wrote my task code over here on the left, and here's how I can call it, and I can make this an extension. You'll see in the full example, because I couldn't fit everything on this, how to make how this becomes an, a part of the extension. 
Um, here's what this JSON task definition looks like for that classify raster uh, task. So note this name right here, and we'll, we'll point this out in a little bit more detail. So this is the name of, I'm calling this classify raster is the name of my task. Uh, it does not have to be the same as the routine that I'm calling classify underscore raster. So here's the name of the task. And that's what I put in the MB task as an argument to the MB task function right here. And then the routine is the name of the procedure that's going to get called when I execute this task. So that's this thing right here. Okay. And then we won't go through all these other things, but you, uh, uh, I'll show you, we'll talk about what these all mean later, but these are just parameters that you have to create to to create these. There's a whole set of help to describe those. We'll, I'll point out to those in a minute, but for the parameters, I, for each parameter you have on your function, you can, on your procedure, sorry, you define them, what their names are, uh, whether they're input outputs, whether they're required or not, what kind of data type they are, and you have a fast rate options in that regard. These are output raster, why, why there are two of them. Hey, uh, what's this output raster URI? We'll talk about in a second. Um, but there's the um, the output raster. Well, we, we have output raster, but this output raster is not part of my keywords. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so here's a basic general uh, definition file. Okay, so that JSON definition file is um, a form is one is built on one of these uh, task templates as we call them the JSON formatted as I mentioned prize the input output parameter descriptions etc um, so there are different versions and I'm going to go back to my web browser over here talk about those templates for a second I know this is a lot this is this is a lot to absorb at the moment so um, you know, go back and and review some of this later. So, oops. Okay. Okay. So this there's multiple task templates. Uh, the one I have, the one I have in the in the course materials is one that we created based on an earlier version. So uh, you won't see all of these in there, but this is the for. 551 and later, which includes 553, these are the templates you need. What you pay, need to pay attention to is some of the names may change with the different versions, uh, the naming conventions, and then that we've also added other key uh, parameter keys that you can use that help you out. Uh, also, different data types were available, weren't available. Some data types weren't available in earlier versions, um, and allows you to do some other uh, other fancier things to help you out. This is what I was looking for. Okay, never mind. So, uh, you know, go ahead and review those things later on uh, at your leisure. And if you have troubles, you know, let us know. Okay. Now, one key point I will mention is if you're building a task that you need to, that needs to work with previous versions of Envy, you need to make sure that task template uh, is compatible with that different version of Envy. So, um, and build your task definition uh, to match that is compatible with that that Envy version. So that does matter. Okay, let's see. So these are the task keys, as I mentioned. Uh, you saw the more recent list for the version we have. These are some of the details. I won't go through all these, but um, check your Envy help, as you saw me do, uh, for more information and details on those. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> Let's talk about, I, I kind of went through this a little bit in, in haste, but let me just slow down a little bit and just show you how these, how the pro, how the, how the, the dot profile and the um, task files are connected. So on the left here is uh, just a snippet out of the task definition file. Uh, as I mentioned, this name right here is the name of my, ta name of my task. And that is what I put in as an argument to the ME task procedure. Uh, this re this right here, the routine key, tells the tells me the name of the procedure that I need to call to run that 
classify raster task. And that's that procedure name that we, you saw earlier with that code. So that matches this, this matches that. Okay. And then um, there's some other, other things we'll point to. So um, your output raster URI is one of the parameters to our function, to our procedure. Here's its name and it's part of the, it's portion of the, the um, task definition. Uh, so this matches the the um, the keyword here. Um, it's direction, so it's an input. So this will allow, will allow the user to ent enter uh, output file name if they so desire. It's not required because uh, if I if I leave this blank, then Envy will generate the output file for me. And in a lot of cases, you want just let let it do that, especially. If you're doing batch processing or if you're in a modeler, then you don't have to try to figure out how to name that thing. You aren't required to name it. Envy will figure it out. Envy will pass that down to your your routine internally. So you don't have to think about this. So this is kind of a benefit of the task system. If you leave this blank, Envy will pass, will, cap, will generate that temporary name and assign it to this, this uh, parameter behind the scenes. <clears throat> Uh, on the right here, we have the output raster. Now, this is a more magic behind the scenes that you don't necessarily have to think about. Uh, this keyword is not present on my call to the function to the procedure, uh, but it's linked to the output raster URI using this URI parameter key, uh, key here. So internally, Envy knows how to deal with that. So when it creates the output file, then it creates an output raster object that then we can access right here. So I didn't have to think about it. It happens automatically behind the scenes, uh, et cetera. So I don't have to go and open the file. Again, it's already been assigned to this, that are open and assigned to this variable. And then what you see on the left here is the dynamic GUI UI that comes up when I just, when I um, execute this, um, this command right here. So this comes up, I, I didn't, I didn't write any widget code. I don't have to. I don't have to worry about the um, uh, the events that come back from it or anything. I don't have to worry about what happens when I press the OK or what happens when to cancel. I handle the UI, so I check to see if someone hit the cancel button, so I can return, right? But I don't have to build this whole widget stuff. So it's pretty handy, and that's a really basic one. But you can develop more sophisticated ones. Okay. All right. Now for the PowerPoint stuff, let's go do some real stuff. Um, so <clears throat> let's start out with an IDL task example. So first before I do that, um, what I suggest for you guys to do that if receives our our training materials, so um, I put uh, my training materials in my train this C colon training folder. You'll probably get this um I MV IDL task course dot zip file, just unzip it, put it in here. Okay. So you see there's a, you'll have a PowerPoint that you see me working here. Uh and then this course material, if you click on the web, that's and you open the HTML, that's that other HTML document I showed you initially. That's this document right here. You can bring it in. Uh this course. Uh, inside the web thing, there's this chapters folder. You keep going down here. Here's the code, and I'll show you how to set that up. But here's all the code and examples that we're going to use in a second. And also, there's the course data. Sorry. So there's the several uh, different data sets that we're going to use in this in running this um, these examples. Okay. So, uh, so you want to start up NV and IDL. Oh, thought I had it open already. I did. Huh? Cancel. I already had it open. Um, okay. Bring it over. All right. <clears throat> well, before I do that, let's just summarize what we're gonna, what we're going to do, and then we'll go do it. So first, we're gonna we're gonna add that directory to our IDL path. So we're gonna go in the workbench. I'll show you how to do this. Um, we go to the IDL, we go to pass, and we're going to add that that folder where we have the course materials in this overview 
and make sure you check this box and it will add those the, all those routines to the IDL path so that it can find this edge canny task, right? Uh, then we create an instance of it by just using it, calling the IDL task function, very similar to the envy task function, right? So I just put the name of the IDL task that I want to call. Um, I get its input. I, I pass uh, this file as the input parameter because it's all it needs, and it executes, and it creates these output parameters. And we'll look at the task information in the end. And then, um, and this image function displays the before and the after result. So we'll all do that together. You get to type, uh, or you get to type because you'll see me put these in there. Well, you can type those commands right there. So you'll see me bring it up in a second. So let's go to the workbench. <clears throat> and what I did, yours will probably be blank except for default. Uh, all you have to do is go to new project, type the name of your project in there. I put training in there. Click on the create project from existing directory, hit browse, and go to that directory. And we'll click on it because I already have it set up. But Training, oh man. Training, course, overview. So that's what you would click. It would look like that, hit finish, and whatever name you put here would show up here. Okay, so I'm gonna hit cancel because I've already done it. So you'll get, ex you'll get um, um, access to the code, actually. You need to look further, actually. So you don't have all that other stuff. Sorry. You want to go to web, chapters, sorry. And at least go to the code. Click on the code directory. So it looks like that. And when you do that and hit finish, it will at least give you the you see, you know, see all those other files. Okay. So what we want to do, we want to go into IDL task examples here. We're going to go into edge canny and we're going to open up both of these two files. So just click on them and just open them. Sorry, double click, double click. There we go. So I'm going to expand this out. <clears throat> I'm going to push this over so we can see both of them at the same time. So um so the this pro edge canny is that canny edge filter um it has its parameters are input before and result uh they're keywords right um so it does fancy stuff we won't go into all the details what it's doing but input is going to be if you look over here on the right to its task file input is a input um it's an input it has a choice list of of image TIFF or Boulder TIFF, so we're gonna we're gonna pitch. It's default. If you don't give it anything, it's gonna select uh, image TIFF. So, and then uh, it's a required parameter, so you got it. So if you don't put anything, it's gonna use the default value. Uh, and then before and result are outputs, and it's gonna return these whether you like it or not. So how do we run these things? So we're gonna go. I don't need NV at the moment, so I'm gonna dot reset here. Okay. Um, and then we're going to type, because I don't trust myself in typing those individual commands. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, I'll put this over here so we can see. I'm going to, I'm just going to type these things. So uh, T equals IDL task, edge canny. Okay, so it creates an instant. If you type, so if you just type T there or task, whatever you named it, you, it gives you the details of your task, uh, what its inputs and outputs are, and whatever types are. Basically, uh, it creates an, it's creating an object class for that particular task. So, so we mentioned it was object oriented, so that's what that does. We're going to set the input parameter T dot input equal to image dot tiff. Now, I didn't see it in the in the code. 
it knows where to find image.tiff. That's why I don't have to give it a full path. Let's hit enter. Uh, that's all the input parameters, so I'm going to do t.execute. Okay. Second. All right, so it's done. And then to display it, I'm just going to go b image equals t dot before. So the image function knows how to, how to handle this. It's creating a, some PNG file, so it knows how to handle a PNG file. So it pops up the before image and result. There we go. And so you can produce those fairly easily, display these. Uh, there are other examples. Um, hopefully I was straightforward. Uh, there are other examples in the code base. Uh, let me expand that out. Get rid of these fellas here. Under um, the ideal task example is a simple addition one. You can that's covered in that uh, web browser uh, document. There's another. There's a couple other ones that you can try and play around with. We're not going to spend time doing those today, lack of time. But there's a couple examples of how to build these as well. All right. So that's the that's the IDL tasks. So we'll get rid of those. That. Where is my PowerPoint here? Move you over here again. Okay. Um, hopefully you didn't have any questions. Didn't see any. Okay. Moving on. All right. So now let's go back to now let's go back to the MB task. So this is a busy slide. Um, uh, so we'll just walk through these and then we'll go through this in examples. So first to um, so we've written, we go back to, actually, we'll go back to our NVIDIA IDL directory first. Uh, let's open up this classify raster routine and the classify raster task, not the 53 task yet. So put those over there, open them up side by side. So this is the code you saw, slightly different from what you saw in the, um, in the uh, PowerPoint. I don't know why I lost the deceiving routine. Uh, task in here, but it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> so again, it has you know input raster, output raster URI. Uh, it checks to see if MVs is started or not. So you don't have to do that necessarily. You do need at least the MV current this line because you're going to be X generally, well, not in this case so much, but you may or may not need this line. Generally, I would always put it in there. Um, here I'm going to get an instance of the ISO data classification task, uh, pass in the input raster that I, that I passed in. I'm going to pass that, then it's going to execute. I'm going to pass by the output of the classify task uh, to as the input to the smoothing one, and so on. Uh, the smoothing one goes as an input to the aggregation task. So what this is doing is just doing ISO data. It's take using default parameters that we're not going to set. You can set how many classes it, it you want by setting those parameters. For simplicity, we're just going to take the defaults. Um, and then uh, at the end, we're going to set the output raster URI, which we passed in. Uh, either we specified the file name or we allowed MV to create the file name. That gets passed to the output of the aggregation task, which is our final output. And then we execute it. Okay, so that's going to happen. Um, so, to okay, and there's one last one last thing. Um, yeah, okay. Hmm. I was looking for something. Okay, so now we can we can take these routines here, uh, these two routines, and we're going to copy these to um, back to this parameter here. Uh, so uh, we're going to copy these files these files to our to our custom code directory. Now the reason I'm doing that is because I want to um, uh, it, some of us don't always have access to copy things to the main uh, MB install directory, which is usually in C, program files, Harris, blah, blah, blah. We don't always have access to that. 
And so, but you have access, you always have access to your own custom folder. So we're going to stick that there. Uh, okay, so we're going to go to here. Okay, where is my, okay. There. Shortcut here. Let's go. So here's my, here's my custom code folder. Uh, I thought I had a hit copy. Sorry. Thought I hit copy. Okay. And we're going to paste those in there. There we go. Now, note, I'm going to put the pro in there for now, but usually if I'm happy, I'm going to hit save, compile, and save it, but I'm not going to do that. And I got to get rolling because I'm almost, I got to get rolling with these. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to start up Envy. I don't want the password. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, okay, we're good. Um, so we're going to start if MB from the command line, E equals MB parentheses. Um, so MB is the function. If you just type MB at the command line, that's going to bring up classic. So we don't want to do that. So E equals MB is to bring up MB. Um, now, once you put those task files in the right place, when MB starts up again, it will realize, recognize that that task is there. No, no, they compiled the module. So if you don't have IDL, license for IDL, putting the profile is not going to find that. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now we're going to come back over here. And we're going to so open up this, uh, load this run classify raster task dot profile, just hit compile. And then we're just going to hit run. And what we're going to do is going to select, it's going to bring up the GUI. So we hit run. There we go. And it's going to um, pro, it's going to bring up this dynamic UI. Like I said, I, you saw there's no code that I wrote to bring this up. We're going to select our input raster. So we're going to go over to um, course data. So go into your course data directory, MB. You can either pick Sent or Neon, it doesn't matter. I'll pick the Neon one. Hit OK. I'm going to leave the output raster thing alone. I'm just hit OK. So it's going to run, it's going to collect the output, and it's going to display the original file and the output file. Um, in your custom tasks, you can also add uh, those progress bars you saw. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. But here's the here's the output the the output of that classify raster task, which really combines a bunch of others. Okay. Uh, if we were all together, I'd say anybody has any questions, but <laughs> it's just me talking. So you're welcome to ask questions if you need need to. Um, feel free to do that. All right, so we're going to close that. Okay, uh, so we're going to move on. So uh, I want to point out a couple things. Uh, I don't know when. Oh, darn it. It goes on the other side. Okay, uh, so you see we ran this one. There's our output. So depending on when you receive these uh, tools, there was a typo in that. In that classify underscore raster pro, it had a typo, um, so it should be this. So I fixed that in the updated updated uh, version. So note, you can also use this thing in the modeler. So I want to go back real quick to do that. I still got MD up and running. I do. So as you, so now that it's a task, it's part of all the tasks. So when it queries uh, the task system, uh, the list of tasks, it'll find the classify things. So we'll show you how to do that. Real quickly, we got we got uh, one more to cover, so we're we're cruising along. Come on. Okay. 
So here's the modeler. You guys have seen us do this. I'm going to go into search thing. I'm just going to hit uh, classify. And there's my classify raster task amongst all these other ones. So I'm going to bring that one in. I'm going to go, I'm going to, I want to view it. I'm going to do some viewing. I need an input parameter so I can select my input and output files if I so desire. And it's easy, it's just as easy as select. I want the input raster. I'm not going to prompt myself for the output raster, or I don't want that. I'm going to connect this one to the view. I also want to view the original. So I'll click that to that one. And I want the input raster, so I'll connect those two. As simple as that. Hit OK. Uh, I could save it, but I'm just going to hit Run. It's going to prompt me for the input raster. And I'm going to select the one I just selected. And just for grins, we're going to run the Sentinel one, just so, just for grins. This one has 10 bands. And hit OK. It's going to go do its thing. And here we get our result. Move this up to the top so you can see the classification. There you go. Simple as that. So, so you saw we built a custom task. We called it uh, the one. I'll show you the next one. We'll just create an extension, and then we'll uh, we can run it there. But we 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 can build the task. If you remember in the modeler, we can then also go back and um, we can uh, generate an IDL code. We can generate generate a Python program, we can generate a meta task, which then allows us to publish this task to ArcMap and ArcPro, so we can do those things. We won't do those today because we don't have time, but uh, all that works, all tied together. Okay, uh, let's see. So that's done with, I think we're done with that example. Hopefully this is, hopefully this is coming clear to you guys. Okay, um, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. All right, so the next thing we want to do uh, is the last thing we're going to cover is how to convert an, an existing routine that isn't a task already to a task. And we're specifically going to focus on uh, converting any classic routines to tasks. So, you know, we can't, we can't directly call these classic routines directly as any task. So uh, there's reason for that, um, but um, the API is different, so we have to, but we can call them underneath the hood. And in fact, some of those ME tasks from that big 230 list, uh, that's exactly what we did. We uh, rather rewrite them, we wrap them, we wrap them up, create a wrapper like I'm about to show, like, like I'm going to create, similar, and we call them underneath the hood. So, um, so uh, there's a couple ways you can go about doing this. You can create a lightweight wrapper, which I'm going to do to make to actually gather the inputs from the user and pass them to the function that was the original classic routine. Um, so, so that's what we're going we're gonna to do. You can all, uh, one of the things you also um, need to keep in mind, like I mentioned for a regular task, is that oops, is that you don't want user interaction within that classic routine because uh, now that's going to be part of our task, so you can't do that. Uh, the wrapper task can be your middleman between the MV API and the classic API. So here's some other fun handy functions to know. So those of you that are familiar with our classic API, uh, uh, files are associated with what they call a file ID or FID for short. Um, and uh, whereas in MV, uh, the MV API uh, uh, references files as objects. So there's this there's this function called MB raster to FID. So if I have a raster object in the end of the API, but I need to call a classic routine, which you can perfectly do within inside your classic, within your MD API, uh, you can still do those. Those still things, things work. You need this function, this MB raster to FID, so you can get the FID to pass to those, to those routines. If you're going the other way around, I have a FID and I need to get the raster 
associated with that, I use this MB fit to raster. So you see we use uh, the first one in a second. But now I can, after I have my classic routine is processed and created the fit, I can now get the associated raster object by the, by the head. Um, so many of, note that many of MB's classic do-it routines have already have MB task equivalents. For instance, this, the MB quack do it, well that's now, there's a task called quack. Uh, for the uh, spectral adaptive coherence estimator ACE, and the ACE do it was the classic routine. Now here's the task. And you'll see me use this or a semblance of this one in a second. And there's there's uh, see the help for many others. We don't have time to go through all of them. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here fairly fair, fairly similar similar. So we wrote some uh, so codes. We have this classic routine, which is the original one. You'll see the code in a minute. Uh, we want to copy that to our custom code directory. We created a task procedure. This is the wrapper that calls this, this the classic routine. We'll put that in the, the the directory as well. We created our task or our, our JSON task file. We'll put that in that directory. And then we had this white fine white plane UI dot pro. So this is an extension that also calls the dynamic UI. So we're going to copy that not to the custom code folder but to our extensions directory. And when we run this thing, it'll pop up this, this, this dynamic UI. Again, we didn't write this, this thing. And we can run it and it'll produce our results. And then here's, a, we can also run it. Now that it's a task, we can run this in a modeler as well. So we're running the modeler because you just saw me do that, but we'll do this one. This one's different from the others because this particular task is gonna uh, bring in a spectral library. We have a spectral library of a specially painted white plane. It's got a special white plane paint, not just your standard white paint, it's a special white paint. So we want to find that that plane in our image, and we're going to ace to help us do that. Um, now, granted, we're cutting some corners on some of the processing that we normally would do. It's already been converted to reflectance, so we don't have to do that. Um, so just for an instance, in Demo purposes, we're going to do that. So we need to, let's bring up our fine white planes task. Uh, no, I don't want that one yet. Fine white plane. Okay. I got some extra code in here for you guys to, to look at. So fine white plane, I need that one. Uh, where's the UI one? There. And the task folder. Okay. All right. So here's the, here's the classic routine. Um, it has keywords, uh, it takes in a FID, a spectral library, and an output file. Uh, this is all checking keywords here. So we open in the file, we're reading the spectral library to pull out the, the especially white air, aircraft paint that we want. Resample, we got to resample the spectra uh, to the image. We create some stats, and then we create ACE, because ACE, ACE needs some stats. Okay. The wrapper to that, so that's a classic routine. Our task our task routine is just is as, as simple as this. We we it has to be parameters again. So we have our input raster, our spectral library file that we got to pass in. Here's our output raster URI. Make sure Envy's running. Now it, uh, we need to pass a fit into our classic routine. So we got to use this Envy raster to fit. We pass in the raster we just opened. It gets a fit, and then we can pass that to that function, and we run that function. Simple as that. The uh, task file, here's what it looks like. It's got its names. We'll go through here's the input raster, spectral library file. Its, it's name is MVURI, because we're passing in a file name. And then these two parameters you've seen before. And then the last one is, now we're going to make this an extension. So, to create an extension, you need to create, uh, you follow this construct. So um, you'll see where that lands. There's, um, and then here's the UI routine that we're going to call that it's going to do the things that um, you saw me, that was in, that was, you saw me do. And I've got to delete all this stuff I was playing around with. So just ignore that. It's all commented out anyway. All right. So here's what we want to do. We want to take, um, just grab, I would grab all four of those files at once. Just be, it'll be easier. Uh, just make sure you grab the right ones. Find white plane, that one, that one, and the UI. That one. So I'm going to copy those. 
I'm going to go here to here. At first, I'm going to just copy and paste them all into this folder in my custom code folder. And then I'm going to move the... Um, In the extension. I'm going to move the find UI white plane one to my extensions folder. There we go. Make sure it's there. Okay. And then what I want to do is I'm going to restart Envy so I can find it. I don't know why it's well, I don't know why it does that. So <laughs> sometimes it does it. I don't know. <clears throat> So we're almost done. I got like five or ten more minutes. So uh, those of you that can't stay past the hour, I apologize for going over. Uh, but you can just stay five or ten more minutes. I'll be done. Um, okay. So once the MB is started, it gets its act together. One. Do your thing. Where is it? Where is it? Over here? There it is. Okay. What you'll see. In your toolbox over here under extensions is my fine white plane. You should find, you won't have the vegetation delineation. I forgot to get rid of that. Uh, but you'll see this fine white plane uh, extension. So if you double click on that, it'll bring up my dynamic GUI, use UI. I go and select, if you go into the, uh, this directory, go into the directory called Avarice. Select the San Diego Reflectance.dat file. Okay. So, average airborne sensor built by JPL. Uh, so, this is 224 bands. It only has 189 because some of those are marked as bad bands, so it's not going to process those. Um, we have selected our spectral library file, so that's the San Diego library.sli. It has multiple spectral library spectra in it, you'll see in a second. We're going to leave the output thing blank. We're going to hit OK. Uh, it brings up Spectral Library Viewer, it's computing some stats, computing ACE, and there's a the result. Now what ACE has done, it's uh, the brighter ones are, are, are closer matches to my, my spectra, but if you go and threshold this image, and I could have added thresholding in there if I wanted to, but uh, I didn't want to go Mod I had had to go modify the task originally, so I'm going to select my white plane output and we'll turn preview off. I'm going to move this over to about 0.6. I'm going to hit the preview on, and there's my white plane that I was after. That's the white plane where its target is. Trust me. Uh, I'll hit my transparency. Whoops, not that out on that. On that. So there's my there's my specially painted white plane with just that signature on it. It done I don't I didn't notice where it picked up on anything, so it depends on where you set that threshold, obviously. But that's the paint that's the airplane I was looking for. Okay. Uh so you see I do that. We can again as a task, we can run into modeler. We're, we're gonna skip that. So this will show this gives you we'll run all that. Um we cover the code a little bit. Uh, we cover that. So here's the here's the uh, the result. Note that I used our, our our push the PowerPoint thing. So I had my template. So it created this PowerPoint slide for me. I drew the I could have drawn these annotations on there, but I I, I do them by hand later because uh, I forgot. Um, so that's the result of that. So that's how you can take a classic task, or it does, or it can be not not even a classic task, but an MV in every routine that was not already a task, you can turn it into a task by doing those other couple of things. So um, the last thing, okay, so there's one other thing that I had to cover. Um, I'll go to the task tips, I'll come back to the last thing. So here's some task tips you can cover. So you wanna be consistent if you're building a lot of tasks, use a similar name so you know everyone knows what these are. You don't want to add spatial or spectral subsetting parameters to your task. Use the MV subset raster and pass that subsetted image into your task rather than do that. You can use the style sheets that we talked about to get a customized dynamic UI. Those are great. 
uh, see the help on this broadcast get broadcast channel uh, function that allows you to have those those progress bars as part of your tasks as well. Uh, let when possible let MB handle the creation of the output file names. This is really important when you um, if you're using a modeler to do batch processing, if you're doing it in GSF, also let it create its the file names for you. It puts them in a in a known location so you can deal with it. But you can, if you really have to specify the output file names, you just build that into your task definition and your appropriate uh, keyword parameters. Um, uh, just note that uh, once you create a uh, MV task cannot be run in classic. That's basically what that's saying. So, um, but you can run classic routines within the NV API. You just can't go the other way. If you get stuck, you need help, need additional tips on how to do these. You know, reach out to us. Let us know. Uh, various folks, myself, uh, our tech support, uh, or others can help you on those. This other one I went to. I went and converted the original classic routine to the equivalent of MV tasks replaced all the do its with or classic functions with their with their corresponding classic routines. That code is that code is in the um in the repository that I gave you already. <coughs> Those are in there. There's a UI uh function as well. There's also a Sentinel uh task in there if you want to play with around with that one, etc. And now I'm over by seven minutes, but um, that's all I can cover for the day. So uh, there's obviously more details we can go through. So if you have any questions on those, my Steam colleagues are listed here. My contacts on the front page. You know, reach out to us if you have any extra help or need any help uh, or additional training on how to do these in more slower and um, more detail, more options. But I, I appreciate you taking your time out to join us. Thank you for um, indulging with me and joining with me. And I'm going to turn it back over to Spencer. Uh, I'll look back to you, man. Uh, so thanks, Greg. Uh, I hope you guys uh, got as much out of that as we were hoping you would. Um, we do plan, so all of the all of the information that Greg presented today and all of the data will be available if you go through our website uh, through the Defense and Intel training series. So this is the last um, scheduled uh, webinar that we have currently. We are planning to host a few others in the short term future um, in terms of what those will be about. So we have um, we're, we're still in the planning process of that, but we are planning to do a larger what's new and what's upcoming in NV webinar sometime in July that will um, discuss some new releases and new features and functionality uh, in in upcoming versions of NV. Um, but from all of us here, for James, for Greg, um, and for our, our wonderful marketing group, we just want to thank everybody for participating. If you've made it through all six of these, uh, over the last, I guess that's 12 weeks now. I can't believe we've made it 12 weeks, um, but we're still, we're, here we are. Um, thank you guys all for participating and um, pay attention to our website and we'll keep you posted on future webinar series. Uh, with that, um, and I do see a question, sorry, thanks for getting all those questions, but with that, uh, we'll say goodbye and until next time, take care.